Good evening. Thank you for being here for a very interesting uh, discussion, which is on uncertainty. We are usually very comfortable thinking about and talking about what is certain. And something which is uncertain is not always comfortable. The only perhaps caveat is that at times we are comfortable with uncertainty because that gives us loopholes for excuses, either be psychological, moral, etc. Because the unlimited nature of human action or the possibility of human action also gives human choices in a, in a varied manner. And when there are choices uh, which are more than one, we can always uh, also believe that our actions can, uh, will hold some element of uncertainty because the course of action, the course of outcome could be different. So as choice-making individuals, as choice-making uh, entities, uh, uh, I think in, to some extent uncertainty is inbuilt in us. Uh, we are uncertain because we are able to make different kinds of choices. But uh, there are also issues that uh, whether uncertainty is something which one should thrive for, one should uh, you know, encourage in ourselves or what exactly is the implication of uncertainty as a psychological factor. In this discussion, I doubt whether we would have a discussion on quantum mechanics uh, and related areas, uh, maybe for a difference because we thought we will discuss the mechanic, me mechanisms of human mind. And uh, so perhaps I think all of us are very passionate about what we are going to talk about this evening. So it will be more human centric and of course animal centric as well from the point of, point of view of a human. Uh, so uh, we have a very interesting set of people and I'm so grateful that they all agreed to do something which is very kind of esoteric. This is very uncommon, this kind of a platform, you know, four different people sitting and discussing on what? Uncertainty. At, at, at first sight, it may look very insignificant, right? Who wants to discuss on uncertainty? People want to discuss on what is certain. Why waste time, you know? So, but, uh, so we have a very interesting set of people today and uh, my talk will be limited because in between I will be talking and uh, connecting things. So this is the uh, format which we have and these are the people we have. So may I say a couple of lines because I, I see a lot of new faces as well. Uh, my colleague uh, Anintya Sinha, he, he's a well-known primatologist, he loves watching monkeys, uh, he of course watches human beings also once in a while, but his first love is to watch monkeys and you would have seen some pictures, right, with intense look of Anintya watching a monkey. So, uh, so Anintya uh, will take a very different point of view this evening. Uh, and uh, he works in NEAS, he heads the program on animal behavior and cognition at this institute. And my colleague uh, to my right, uh, Subhachandran, uh, he is a person of very different interests and a person with an ability to bring together very discordant, uh, unrelated things together in a very integrated manner. So I think today he is going to uh, take a view which is perhaps very interesting to be seen in the context of uncertainty. Uh, Subha Chandran uh, is a professor at the uh, International Strategic uh, Studies Group at this institute and uh, to our extreme right is uh, Nitin Nagaraj, some of you might have heard him before. Uh, Nitin also is a very interesting um, mind for him. Uh, he is also a poet, he is a dreamer, sometimes he dreams and then wakes up and writes about dreams. Maybe we're not very often, but at least I have got the fortune of reading some of that. But uh, technically, he is um, an engineer and uh, he worked in GE and one day he thought he should give up that job and do something perhaps which is more uncertain. So that's how he is in NIAS. He gave up his job in NIAS. He joined NIAS in our Consciousness Studies program and that's how he, he is here. So I guess... Uh, uh, we will start our discussion and the discussion is in this format which is uh, each, each of my uh, colleagues will speak maximum of 15 but perhaps 10 minutes ideally and then uh, there will be a little bit of internal debate, inner debate, this much space and then we will throw it to you and uh, this, is, this forum is not to agree, this forum is to disagree, fight, 
of course in a decent manner we won't uh, we won't emulate the manner which we saw today at 6:30 a.m. Uh, with a very important debate which happened right so we'll be very respectful in our debate i guess so that's how it starts uh, so may i request anindya to start the ball rolling um thank you sanita uh, i hopefully will take only 5 minutes uh, <clears throat> so i think uh, Yes, this is obviously a topic that uh, can be debated at length, discussed at length, and that is what I hope we will be doing. But let me just leave you with three thoughts that I've had about uncertainty, and I speak first as a biologist, which of course we all of us are in our own ways, unique ways, and then I also speak as a human being, which again all of us are in this room, but not necessarily so in the larger world that we live in. So thought one. and that's about the uncertainty of our existence the definite cycles of life and death death that is so certain and as poets philosophers or biologists have pointed out it's death that requires certainty in order to ensure life afresh but why must we die why could the living not be eternally alive and the biological answer i think to this difficult question lies in evolution One of the greatest gurus in my own personal life, Charles Darwin, suggested that the roots of our understanding of death must lie in yet another uncertainty, the uncertainty of our world, the world that we live in. What he and other thinkers have reminded us is that in a world which is forever changing, life must adapt. Whatever species you may belong to, you need to adapt or perish. and each living being must assume and take on new forms new functions new cap- capabilities that would allow it to adapt to these uncertain changing conditions that may suddenly arise and for these new forms to originate and evolve the old must die to to make way for the new and hence yes it is the uncertainty of our environment which ensures that life is followed inevitably by death and this must be so so that life can continue hopefully eternally thought two moving from the endless cyclical processes of uncertain life and certain death let us turn to the uncertainties that each of us face every day of our everyday lives each day of our everyday lives let us turn from the species to the individual while such uncertainty offers on one hand to the imaginative and the romantic new challenges new ways of living and coping this uncertainty can also punish us with the stress and strain of our existence whether it be a child leaving home or a parent who is ill uncertainty often plagues us to an extent that life becomes almost at times unbearable and yet we struggle we cope and we survive how does this become possible life amidst such uncertainty becomes possible because our minds our intellects and our cognitive capacities i believe have evolved in ways that allow us to cope with life's uncertainties in the course of my own studies with non-human species i have realized that the greatest mental challenge to each and every individual is to handle uncertainty if a phenomenon is certain and always predictable simple rules and processes are sufficient to handle it no thought or reflection is necessary but let the situation become unpredictable or uncertain and immediately we need to gather all our resources physical mental or spiritual to be able to successfully overcome the uncertainty and ensure our survival beyond that point In fact I would go to the extent of suggesting that the cognitive abilities of all living forms and this we can differ on how we define cognition but all cognitive abilities of living forms have evolved and persisted again I believe occasionally refining themselves for the simple sake of coping with the uncertainty of life thought three I now examine my own life once again but not as a biologist as I've been doing so far but as an ordinary human being living a life in a way that I have chosen to. What I realize when I reflect upon my own existence is that some of the most enriching moments in my life have been those that were uncertain. Uncertain in their coming, 
uncertain in their course of action or flow and uncertain in whether they would ever come again into my life. And while such moments are likely to fill us with trepidation, with worries, with occasional helplessness, these fleeting experiences also impress us and make them so valuable because of their inherent uncertainty of existence. What is certain is often staid and boring, predictable and soporific. What keeps us alive, literally on our toes sometimes, are the moments of unpredictability, of uncertainty. And they are made richer and sweeter by our lingering thought that what we have just experienced may have been a moment of a lifetime never to come back to us again. So let me end here uh, with some words of another of my great gurus, Rabindranath Tagore. In one particular song, this is what Tagore says. And if you pardon me, let me say it in the way that I think expresses it best. Mune ki vidhare ke gele chule shedin bhara shaje jete jete duaro hote ki bhebe phirale mukho khani ki katha chilo je mune 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 ki dhar ke dile chule oh what uncertainty you left me with on that day on that day when twilight descended and as you moved gently out of the door i do not know yet why you looked behind what was there in your mind Oh, what uncertainty you left me with on that day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anantya, for such a very enduring way of looking at uncertainty. So I will, st I will not get into um, uh, discussion now, and I will request uh, Subha to speak next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mine will be a... Uh, uh, political science, international relations perspective on uncertainty, more on uh, international relations than political science, uh, primarily looking at how states uh, take decisions uh, at the international level. Uh, the political science perspective of how states take decisions within the country vis-a-vis uh, -vis many, uh, many issues. It's a totally different issue. I'm not touching that. So more from a diplomatic uh, perspective. I'm sure you would have heard uh, some of those. Uh, funny quotes about the diplomat explaining what a diplomat is. And one of those funny, really funny one is he, a diplomat is one who thinks twice or thrice before says nothing. Uh, and then you would have also heard about those telling that the diplomat is when he says yes, he means perhaps. Uh, when he says perhaps, he means no. And when he says no, he's not a diplomat at all. I mean, why is this ascribed to a diplomat? You know, because he's not certain about his job. Even if he is if he knows it is <laughs> yes, he's not going to say it's it's it's, it's yes. You know there, there is something in, in in the way that the system is. And before I go into that, uh, uh, I'll just two or three points on on general aspects, uh, countries, states in this in in this in this in in this context. Uh, how certain are states when they take decisions vis-a-vis -vis each other? And uh, later I'll just come to India, Pakistan, keeping in mind what happened in the recent. How certain they are in taking decisions. The second one is, uh, can state afford certainty in taking decisions? Uh, it's, a, it's a different question. Other. One is, you know, whether states can uh, take decisions in an, in an uncertain period. And the other one is, can state afford the certainty, you know, which means you have all the things on your, on your table. And the third question is, is also equally interesting for me. Do big states, especially the powerful states, prefer uncertainty over certainty, you know, or prefer uncertainty? Because that, that that plays into their hands. Uh, you know, you, you start with the great Roman Empire uh, to the, the American and maybe the Chinese uh, in, in the future. Uh, do powerful states prefer uncertainty over uh, certainty? You know? uh, there are two, three thoughts before I go uh, further. Uh, one is uh, we talk about certainty and uncertainty. Can they be quantified? Uh, empirically, uh, you know, uh, or, or if, if, a, if, a, if a decision maker has to take a decision, uh, for example, uh, Obama was left with that uh, that that, uh, that difficult choice uh, that he got reasonable, not reliable, reasonable data from his people that uh, Osama bin Laden is in a particular compound in in, 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 in in Pakistan. Now the decision for him is to 
say yes, go ahead and uh, take him off. You know, there, there are multiple options, in multiple outcomes that could have. You know, including the uh, the falling off one of the choppers. Many things would have happened, but the decision and and uh, the person who finally kind of told uh, the, the the team, uh, we are reasonably sure. I mean, that's what uh, I was told. Not not not. You know. So when when you have that kind of a thing in in your in, in front of you, how reliable your decision making process is. Uh, the theories, of course, uh, take a lot of uh, look into this uncertainty, uncertainty in 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 in, in uh, decision making in, in the international relations. Two theories: one is the the realist and relativist. Uh, uh, they they talk about uh, uh, uncertainty. Even if you are uncertain, they think uh, certainly decisions can be made. Uh, and then there are other theories, other two theories in particular: uh, the uh, the cognitivist. And uh, and I, I missed the name of the other theory. Uh, who talk about even if you have everything in in front of you, uh, don't take uh, decisions. Uh, I mean, go slow, uh, count twice or thrice. Maybe Narasimha was one of those uh, who followed or who who believed in, in in this point. And then there are theories that have come into the recent years to justify you taking decisions arbitrarily or even based on uncertainty. Uh, the theory of preemptive strikes. You know what, what the preemptive strikes talks about, or the collateral damage theory talks about this. Uh, is even if you have taken a decision, even if it doesn't gone that way, this is this, you have preempted a larger one. The collateral damage basically talks about this is something worth uh, taking it. So th these are some of the theoretical ones. Now I'll go into the uh, this, uh, uh, the recent examples, uh, keeping in mind Indo-Pak uh, uh, crisis decision making. You know. Uh, whether states take decisions when they are certain or whether states take decisions when they are even uncertain. Uh, uh, one is those states that uh, take decisions only when they are certain or those states that, that, that want to play safe. Uh, there are five or six factors that go into uh, when they take when they want everything on, on the table. One is uh, data. Here, as I was telling you, it's not just uh, uh, data should be reliable uh, uh, data. Uh, you know the recent uh, strikes that uh, the India was, India took over the line of control, the surgical strikes. It's it's not that we didn't have that kind of uh, uh, capability earlier. Maybe this time we had. So you know the available data, and how reliable those data are. Uh, yeah, that's one. And the second is even if you have data, uh, the ability and the capability of the state to carry out uh, the data, uh, just carry out uh, carry out a decision. Uh, for example, uh, the Sri Lankan, uh, the, the dropping of uh, uh, the, the Operation Pumalai in 1987 where uh, in the Indian Air Force uh, flew over uh, Sri Lanka, it's, it's violating sovereignty of another country and did whatever. Or the later one in, in, in Maldives where we sent uh, troops to rescue uh, uh, the state in, in, in Maldives. Uh, this talks about the cap capacity and the ability of the state to, uh, to do it. More than that, you know, more than the data and um, uh, and the, your capacity, it's the political will of the state, uh, the ability of the leadership. For example, had it been people today talk about maybe the BJP is trying to put it in a different context. Uh, had it been Manmohan Singh, you wouldn't have taken the decision that what uh, uh, what Modi took. So the ability of the the, the leadership or, or the individual, uh, the role of the individual. And then uh, the last point is on the international response. You know how others would see it. You know, even if I am on the right, uh, you know, especially after the Mumbai attack, I'm sure you would have, you would have come across. Uh, uh, you know, even if uh, everything is going on the side, uh, we were still worried about uh, how international community would would respond. These are those things that you want to play safe, and you have certain decisions, certain decisions, you know. And then, should states be certain? What about those states that who just care a damn about all those things and still go ahead? And on what parameters they they make those uh, decisions? Again, three or uh, four factors. One, they are not looking at reliable data. Reasonable data is fine with me. You know, as long as I have enough uh, data that I can, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, I was talking about Obama making this decision on Osama bin Laden. The same thing was was uh, was given to the state then uh, before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, uh, or the best example is. Uh, on what basis U.S. invaded Iraq? Uh, you know, today you have enough uh, evidence uh, to prove that that decision was based on a on a on a wrong calculation. Uh, but then, during those times, 
you know, when when you look at some of the uh, responses from the state, we have enough reliable uh, data. That's one. Uh, the second one is, you know, people uh, or especially the state take uh, uh, un, 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 irrational or what is seen as irrational because it, it always underestimate uh, the other side. Uh, again, uh, what Pakistan did in 1971, what Pakistan did in during the Kargil war, it underestimated the Indian resolve to 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 uh, to respond. Meaning that uh, it, it did not expect this is the way that India is going to uh, respond. The third one is the bluff part. You just bluff, uh, uh, you know, uh, and you 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 presume that uh, the the bluff takes place in an uncertain environment. The other side do not take uh, decisive action. The entire mad doctrine, mutual assured do destruction doctrine during the Cold War, is based on this this uh, this one. So that that particular period, the Cold War period, was highly uncertain because of of, 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 of this, uh, this this uh, this continuous bluff on 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 by both sides. Uh, now the last part, I'll, I'll end here. Do states have to be certain to take decisions? Uh, you know, it's a very uh, you know we are talking about uh, uh, certainty and uncertainty. Uh, do states, when they take decision, especially on, at at the international level, do they have enough ground and sufficient data, and do they have the luxury of taking decision and based on the reliable data? Uh, maybe in normal times, perhaps yes. You know, if it is a if it is something related to trade and and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and climate change and other issues, you have enough data. But when it's a, when it is a crisis period, uh, on what basis you 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 take uh, decisions? Uh, you know, there is no certainty there. Uh, uh, the second one is I, I my conviction is weak states are the one who want to play safe safe. Our strong states are those one who who care a damn about. Uh, uh, in fact, they they would rather prefer uh, the 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 situation is is is, is uncertain. And I'll conclude with uh, uh, with with uh, our own Narshim Rao strategy. Uh, whether certain or uncertain, don't take a decision. Yeah, because that itself is a decision. Thank you. We'll, we'll come to you, Jivan uh, th th Thank you, Super, for a very, very fascinating way of looking at uncertainty from the state point of view. I think next I will invite uh, Nitin. Nitin has a small PowerPoint because he has to show you a few equations. So I was inspired by the original uh, philosophy chat which happened in the Vanaparva of the Mahabharata. I hope you all recognize this, right? So this is the extra prashna. Um, so you know the story, right? The, the Pandavas, uh, the four of them, they, they reach this um, um, lake which is guarded by a crane and uh, they don't heed to its uh, you know, warning. So they drink the water without answering its questions and they all perish. But Yudhishthira is the wise one. So uh, of course he takes the... Uh, you know the time and the patience to answer those questions. So, inspired by this, I've sort of uh, have, have a contemporary version of this. Uh, and the, the original extra prashna was actually deeply philosophical and metaphysical in nature, and it had 18 uh, uh, questions actually. Uh, but obviously, you know, in the interest of time, and uh, you know, so I'm just going to look at six questions. Um, so, let's sort of look at six sort of contemporary questions in some sense, uh, and how the modern uh, contemporary used to try and answer them. Uh, so the first question is the following, um, as of today, there are two members of the Lok Sabha who have the same date of birth, true or false. Second question is, what are the chances that extraterrestrial life exists in our galaxy? Question number three is, will the sun rise tomorrow? Right? I mean, this is very, these are very uh, fundamental basic questions that all of us have. So the Aksha is asking these questions with this drama. The fourth question is, am I inside a room? Okay, how do I know that I am located inside a room? Uh, question number five is uh, okay. A fair coin is tossed, a dice is rolled. What will turn up? And there's a sixth question. I will come back uh, to that question in the in the end. So let's see how Distra tries and answers each one of them. 
So the first question, uh, I'm sure you probably know the answer that uh, the good thing is that complete disorder is not possible. Um, so we have, um, you know, I mean, of course, I cannot say that about the Lokasabha per se, but uh, definitely the, there are 545 members in the Lokasabha and there are only 365 days. So even if you assign each person a different date of birth, you have the original principle which says that, look, you'll have more than one person having the same date of birth. Uh, now what is interesting is that in this room right now, in this room right now, the probability that two of us have the same date of birth, can anybody take a guess what that probability is going to be? The probability that two of us have the same date of birth in this room here, it's going to be a whopping 90%. It's unbelievable, right? You do the math, you do the calculation. So what you're saying is that uh, the beauty of math is that you can draw these conclusions, you know, uh, from, from the available data. And these are called as existence proofs. So you can prove the existence of something without actually showing it. So right now sitting here, I can say that there are two people in the Loka Sabha who are the same date of birth. I really don't know who they are. But I can convince you and I can give you a mathematical proof. So that's the power of mathematics, you know. So mathematics is, is a game of certainties in that sense. And uh, this actually goes back to what is called as Ramsey theory. So Ramsey theory is about how you cannot avoid structure, avoid order, avoid knowledge. You know, you, you, just, you just cannot make complete disorder. So that's the notion of Ramsey theory. Um, so the power of mathematics is uncertainty, you know. And uh, I don't know about diamonds, but sure, a theorem is forever, you know. Once you prove a theorem, there's nothing like unproving a theorem. If at all a theorem has been unproved, it means that it was not a theorem in the first place, you know. There's something wrong in the uh, calculation. So that's the beauty of mathematics. So it's, it's a game of certainties. But uh, you would be, uh, I don't know, many of you might be surprised to know that actually at the heart of mathematical knowledge is uncertainty. And this, so we all know that uh, mathematical statements are true or false. There's a law of excluded middle. And what is very important is that we have to give a certificate. So when we say that something is true, I have to produce a certificate. And that certificate is called a proof. And what is very interesting is that there are statements in mathematics which are true for no reason. They're true and you cannot prove it. So these are called as unprovable truths. That is the famous result of Godel, Godel's Incompetence Theorem. And what Kaitin, who showed using algorithmic information theory, is that not only there are statements which are true, which can't be proven, most, most statements are such. Okay, that is really, really, you know, um, quite astounding, right? That most statements are true without a reason. Uh, so this, uh, you know, and it's closely related to the notion of uh, uncomputable programs of Turing's work. And uh, Richard Hamming talks about, uh, are there unthinkable thoughts? I think about it. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, right? Okay, so this is the notion of uncertainty in the mathematical knowledge, you know. Now, what about this question? Will the sun rise tomorrow? Actually, if you look at the original Eksha Prashna, uh, the, one of the first questions which the Eksha asks is actually about sunrise. Where, where does the sun rise and things like that. It's a very interesting, deeply metaphysical. Uh, but uh, you can take a very uh, a Bayesian view of it, a Bayesian probability interpretation of it. And uh, as Laplace did, the French scholar Laplace. So you can ask the following question that there is a single sun and there are many days. So uh, what is the probability that the sun will rise tomorrow given the fact that I have observed the sunrise all these days. You can do the computation and you will get some answer. So uh, I mean the, the, it's not a very difficult computation to do. But you could also do ask the other way. You can say there is a single day, right, but there are many stars. It just happens that I see the sun, right? There are so many billions of stars in the galaxy. So what is the probability of choosing the sun among all these stars? So in other words, every day when I wake up, certain stars will die, certain stars are born, right? So you have to take into account the proportion of stars which are there and the sun is one of them. You can calculate the probability in that fashion. So you see how uh, difficult this question is. It's not easy to answer such questions at all. And, uh, and, and, and this actually leads to uh, other notions of predicting the weather, um, talking about the stability of the solar system, the orbits of the planets, etc, etc, etc. So what actually chaos theory says is that uh, even in a very purely deterministic universe, given all the data that you have, you have unpredictability. Unpredictability is unavoidable. This arises because of uncertainty in the initial conditions. So uh, you might have heard of this statement, right? The butterfly effect, the fluttering of the wings of a butterfly in, in Kanyakumari um, creates a snowstorm in Kashmir, for example. So here the argument here is not so much about causation, but the fact that in your model, when you build a model of the weather, you make an error which is as small as the fluttering of the wings of a butterfly. That error will cascade and give you two different predictions. One prediction it will say there is no storm, another prediction will say there is no snowstorm. So it's not so much about causation, it's about predictability. 
So this is the problem of uncertainty. You know, it's very difficult to say what's going to really happen. Okay, so that's the uh, the third question, right? Um, yeah. So the next question is, uh, uh, is there extraterrestrial life? So this is actually a very interesting question, and uh, I don't know if, whether you are familiar with this equation there. So that's the equation which actually sort of probabilistically predicts how many, uh, what are the chances of having uh, extraterrestrial life in the galaxy which can communicate with us. So this equation is called as uh, the Drake's equation. It goes back to 1961, uh, astronomer Drake who actually founded the SETI, the search for extra extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, it was the first meeting of the SETI uh, group and Carl Sagan was also part of that. And they came up with this fancy looking equation and there's a lot of uncertainty in the equation. So the first term is about the average rate of star formation in the galaxy, you know, how do stars form, what is the average rate. The second term is fraction of those stars uh, having planets. The third one is those planets supporting life. Okay, the first three terms are somewhat uh, reasonable, we can compute them. The last four terms are really, really uh, very difficult to compute. The, the fourth term is about uh, fraction of the planets which can support life. Uh, then the next one is the fraction which can actually, uh, the life which can develop into inter intelligent life and so on and so forth. So what the, uh, the group in 1961 concluded is that uh, the chances that there are uh, intelligent life uh, which can communicate with us is uh, around the order of 1000, 1000 uh, or so, okay, n equal to 1000. Uh, but there are recent computations, it's very debatable. Uh, some computations yield a value of less than 1, which means that we have the only, uh, only uh, uh, intelligent life. Some computation lead uh, to value uh, 100,000. So there's a huge uncertainty. We really don't know, but uh, this is an attempt to uh, answer this question. You know? Okay, so this question about, uh, am I inside a room? Am I located inside a room? Um, from a mathematician's perspective, there are two variables here. What are the two variables? The dimension of the room, obviously, and my dimensions, right? You, those two are the two things, the two variables. And it gets really tricky when I am an electron and the dimension of the room shrink. Okay, so this is the classic Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I know that I am not going to talk about quantum mechanics as Sangeeta said, but I thought, you know, any talk on uncertainty cannot not reference uh, Heisenberg, you know, the famous equation sigma x sigma p greater than equal to h by 2. So what is, so what, uh, so what uh, quantum mechanics uh, at least seem, I am not a physicist, but my understanding is that it's not so much about measurement, it's not about measurement. The fact that reality does not allow you to determine the position and the uh, location, uh, sorry, position and the momentum of an electron simultaneously to a large precision. So it's about nature or reality uh, not pre uh, preventing you from determining it. It's not about measurement, you know. So that's the <coughs> fundamental aspect of, uh, of the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Now, uh, one might ask, does it have any relevance to classical objects, you know? Because when we talk about quantum systems, we are talking about uh, dimensions uh, less than 10 to the power of minus 9 meters, like 100 nanometers, you know. But what about people's chairs, tables, etc, etc. Now, it, it is very interesting that there is a classical uh, version of the uncertainty principle. The classical version, one of the very famous classical version is um, uh, signals. Like, for example, uh, uh, musicians, right? You might have noticed when musicians are tuning instruments, uh, if you are tuning a bass instrument, bass instruments are those instruments which are low frequency, you know. You pluck the instrument, it can be a guitar, it can be uh, the bass string of a, of a violin or whatever. You take a longer duration to figure out the tone, you know. Whereas for a high frequency uh, a tone, you need only smaller duration. So there is this uh, interplay between uh, time and frequency. So if something is more precise in time, it's more spread out in frequency. And, and vice versa. So this duality or this uh, uh, complementarity between time and frequency is very much applicable for classical systems, classical signals. So this is uh, where uncertainty pans out. And uh, coming to the last question, uh, this I think where I think Yudhishthira probably did not really uh, know probability theory well uh, because he lost out on the dive, right? But uh, but this is anyway, we might have learned it, right? Because 12 years of exile, he probably had uh, ample time to learn that you can actually compute the uncertainty of uh, 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 the, you can quantify that when you toss a coin and when you toss a die, the uncertainties are not the same. They are not the same. Because in the, in the case of the coin, you are choosing one out of two alternatives and in the case of die, you are choosing one out of six alternatives. So we intuitively understand that the, the die has more uncertainty, we know that. But Shannon actually made it more precise by giving 
a mathematical expression which quantifies the amount of uncertainty. So when you toss a coin, uh, you remove one bit of uncertainty and toss a die, you remove uh, 2.59 bits of uncertainty. So you can actually compute uh, uncertainty when you are making a choice out of many choices. Okay, so I'm going to end here. The extra person is going to end and uh, there's one more question remaining which I shall come to. So what I want to conclude is that there is unavoidable order. Whether we like it or not, there is knowledge, there is certainty. That's the beauty of, uh, of reality, I would say, that there is unavoidable order. But equally so that there is unavoidable ignorance. You know, you can't get away without, uh, you know, there will always be things which you will not know. Even the most powerful mathematical systems has statements which are true and unprovable. So ignorance is unavoidable. And uh, when you have, and if you think that knowledge is power, with great power, actually really, you know, it, what really comes is humility, right? And that's why you notice that Yudhishthira was the most humble among the, the Pandavas, right? So, it, it is this acceptance of this uncertainty which is fundamental and primal, you know, in, in anything and everything, including mathematics, including physics, uh, you know, and even so, biology, I would, yeah. So, the, the, that, that's where the acknowledging that is where I think humility comes in. And uh, so the last question of the Eksha uh, in my mind would be the following that is there anything that you can be certain of? And uh, uh, if I were Yudhishthira, I would answer yes, the only certainty is the fact that I am aware. Now notice that anything else, you know, is mediated through my conscious experience, right? So the fact that I am aware and maybe the, the I am aware that I am aware, I mean that is something which, 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 just, which just cannot be negated, which just cannot be refuted. So that to me is the only certainty. So I would not accept that death is certain or you know, I, to me that seems like an inference, you know. To me the only certain fact is the fact that I am having a conscious experience. Now what is the nature of that experience, what am I, those are of course questions to be asked subsequently. But uh, definitely I would sort of say that uh, the only certainty if at all. Uh, is I'm certain and I can say it from my perspective. I don't know you all may be zombies sitting here uh, Or this may be a dream or this may be, so I, I don't know about you But I can say that I'm I'm aware and that's the only certainty and that's the reason I think um, in conscious studies program We are interested in this question, you know the most certain thing of our experience. That's what we're interested in So I'm going to end with that and uh, I know we'll have more debates and, and questions. Thank you All right, I guess uh, that's a whole world of uncertainties opened in front of us and I'm, I hope that you are all safely placed on your chairs and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, awaiting uh, some more time of debate and uh, discussion. Uh, of course, all of us, I guess, presented the notion of uncertainty from very different backgrounds. The underlying concepts of our way of perceiving uncertainty was very different and therefore very enriching. Uh, so I think what we will first do is to have a debate or perhaps a dialogue, I mean let's maybe not debate but dialogue opened uh, for uh, the people sitting here and then open to you for your questions but then you can be well armed with your questions and get ready for you know really uh, perhaps uh, talking with the people here. Uh, 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 well, I guess uh, Anindya, Supa and uh, uh, Nitin have presented uh, uh, things which are ironical, things which are contradictory, yet which promotes human action. So it looks like there is at some point vulnerability of human action which is not inspired by certainty but which is certainly inspired by uncertainty. And. Uh, uh, I guess may, uh, all, all, all of us made, uh, all of them made very, very interesting points. I won't go in through it, but uh, perhaps some of the debate amongst us or dialogue amongst us uh, can look into very fundamental issues in this uh, problem itself, which is uh, what is the basis of uncertainty? What do you, uh, of course, I think all of us talked about the outcomes and implications of uncertainty. But what is the basis of uncertainty? Uncertainty is grounded on what? And the other is, I think, a very fundamental question which I'm glad uh, Nitin kind of concluded, which uh, according to him, he said uh, that I am aware is the perhaps the only certainty and not even death. So a counter question could be if, uh, if, we, if we are not certain about life itself, can you be even be certain about asking a question such as I am aware? So how do you place life vis-a-vis -vis 
being aware this is a very fundamentally very uh, deep question as well but even if we take out the depth and uh, ask uh, very apparent and uh, perhaps in a more um, uh, what is visible to us uh, without accounting for uh, death how can we even uh, look at life because all that which we experience in life uh, can be interpreted both in certain ways or uncertain ways because of the degree of ignorance which also I think Nitin brought out. But I think as Subha also said, most of the time decision making, particularly it comes to larger bodies such as state, is based on not all the time on reliable data and full data, but uh, the degree again of uncertainty is very huge. But then perhaps it is this degree of uncertainty, as Anindya said, makes our life very enriching and perhaps our perspectives very enriching. So some of the questions, I think uh, these questions uh, we could uh, spent uh, dialoguing amongst us for perhaps 10-15 minutes so uh, maybe would Anitya like to respond to any of the issues I raised or they raised uh, okay so uh, yeah so what I would ask Nitin is uh, pardon my ignorance here but I still don't know how you define awareness and uh, so so there are two questions here one is what is awareness and is it not possible to conceive of a state where you are not aware, simple, unaware. The second question concerns what is the content of what you are aware of, right? And so therefore are we then condemned to eternally remain focused on just what we, what I am aware of with absolutely no hope of any certainty of what you are aware of. So you see, so, so what I am basically asking you is, can there be a state where you are not aware? Can we conceive of it? Empirical proof for it is a different matter altogether. Can we conceive of it? Or are you suggesting that it is not even possible to conceive of a state of unawareness? And second question I would like to ask you is about the content of awareness. And that might differ. It might differ even within me from one moment to another. And therefore then would you then say the fact that I am aware of the content changing is enough. That's the certainty itself. The content doesn't matter. So, so I don't know what you're thinking about. Uh, okay, so the, the point I would say is that you look at any uh, mathematical theory or any scientific theory. Mathematical theory, we start with axioms. Nothing is out in the air, you know. We always start with something which is a given and we proceed from there on to prove other, other statements. Same thing with sciences. We do observations and we start with some empirical fact in the case of the sciences, right? So in some sense, you have to start somewhere. So if you say that you want to define awareness, that's where the problem is. So you might have to, that the starting point is the fact of awareness. You, you can't define it or derive it, but you can, you can observe it, the fact that you are aware. So to me, that would be the starting point. So it's not so much about defining awareness, but rather starting with at an ontological level with awareness and then trying to explain other stuff out of awareness. Just like how you explain theorems out of axioms, you, you don't explain the axioms, right? But of course, you're free to choose the axioms. I'm saying that if at all we can choose anything as an axiom, it should be awareness because it, it's my experience, you know? So, so I don't know whether that's uh, satisfactory, but what I'm saying is that anything else that you give me a candidate, to me, that's of a lesser degree of uncertainty, you know? Uh, well, I'm sorry. Can I, uh, and also, sure. I'm, yeah, we'll come to you, Jivanla. I, I remember you. Uh, uh, to also perhaps play the devil's point of view here, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Anindya also asked, can we conceive of unawareness? Would you like to respond to that? Yeah. How do we conceive? Do we? we can conceive. I mean, I think uh, conceptually we can imagine, like for example, if I say, can you imagine pink elephants? You can. So conceptually you could probably imagine things. But the question is, is it true in our experience? Ultimately, the, to me, the point is, uh, uh, it has to be reducible to experience, you know. So we can we can imagine probably a state of uh, no awareness, but that's just like thinking of pink elephants, you know. Or I can think of a Pythagorean theorem not being true. I mean, conceptually, I can imagine many things, but does it correspond to something real in the sense of experience? Is what is more important, right? I mean, so I don't know whether there is a conceptual level of reality and there is also an experiential level of reality. So I mean, I don't know whether that. I don't know. Yeah. A pink elephant is as real to me. Even if I never see one. So you, then your definition of reality is different from mine then. So, so it depends on how you define what is real. Because right? I think the problem that I have with your argument is that if you are always starting off with awareness yes. as a given, yes. then there is no debate. 
No, there is a debate in the sense of the content. You talk about content of awareness, right? And no, that's a second level. Yeah, exactly. Which to me is not so See, because you, you can't debate the axioms. So what you're saying is explain the axioms. That's being very unreasonable to me, you know. You have to start somewhere. And my argument is that any other candidate other than awareness to me is of a lesser certainty. I would rather start with something which I'm most certain of. That, that would be my response. Yeah, yeah sure. On the same point, even if I say I am aware uh, that I'm not aware, am I aware then? Yeah, it's it's almost like telling I know I am stupid, but that doesn't make me smart or wrong. So you may be aware that you don't, but that doesn't mean that you are aware. Okay, I think uh, yeah, sure. No, I think I think uh, the, the fact that you're saying that you're you're aware of your unawareness. I mean, that's that's a paradox, right? That's a contradiction. I'm aware of no, that that's a paradox. That's a logical contradiction, right? Uh, I mean, well, uh, that, yeah. well, uh, I, I guess that's a very important point here. Uh, that uh, even to for unawareness to exist, there should be an awareness. That is actually one of the Vedantic viewpoints, also logically. Uh, but I think uh, Anitya also had a further uh, question which is again problematic. Uh, if you start with the uh, once awareness as the most certain given at a point of, at a point, uh, at a given point, uh, are we, are we, are we, uh, aren't we finally kind of becoming solipsistic because we are accountable only for the content of one's experience and not able to see what is the other person's content of experience. So uh, awareness would also limit one's experience according to no, no, I mean, again, it's like saying you stop with the axioms. I mean, I, I think it's a starting point. It's a journey that you make, you know. You don't stop with the axioms. You build theorems, you build theories, you build principles, you build rules of inference. So I don't, I mean, I agree to you that if you stop there, that, that's ridiculous, you know. But my point is about a starting point. I'm saying that you have to start with something which you are, it's very reasonable, irrefutable, and certain. And, and to me, the only candidate, above everything else, there can be other candidates you can, you can bring on the table. But to me, the fact that I'm aware, I, I don't know how you can overlook that, you know, that, that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, that's a starting point, it's not the ending point. So friends, yeah, I'll come back, I'm coming to you, we are going to open it very soon. Uh, so I guess one of the ideas which is being debated here is uh, perhaps from a, both the mathematical point of view and a philosophical point of view. What Nitin uh, wants to stay, uh, say is that we have to start with a given and to him that definite given, that certain given is one sense of awareness, right? That's that's what I think he wants to establish and I think uh, and what Anindya want to raise uh, based on such a perhaps also uh, both experiential and uh, perhaps also a bit metaphysical point of view is that uh, by such a givenness aren't we limited by our own content of experience and how do we how do we understand perhaps the content of the world itself outside aware awareness. Uh, Subha, you want to respond to any of the other, uh, because I think it's also interesting to see, because then since this debate is on uncertainty and uh, Nitin has... Okay, so let me ask a counter question. What, what would you say is the is the starting point then? Okay, if not awareness, what would be the starting point and how would you sort of guarantee its uh, precise, consistent definition? No, uh, a starting point depends on what is the universe we are looking at. Right. So to me, right. when you said awareness, and perhaps because of the examples that you gave, I really do not know mathematics. I do not understand. So is there a mathematical world independent of the biological world? I would not be able to argue about that. But I presume that even a mathematical world exists to a certain extent, even if we consider it as an independent world, because we've been able to conceive of it to a certain extent. I, mean, I know there is this debate about if we did not conceive of it, would it stop existing? So I don't want to get into that. But to me, looking at it as a bar, Mm -hmm. I can imagine a condition of being unaware, right? So if I'm sleepwalking, I'm unaware. If I'm given anesthesia, I'm unaware. And so to me, there is a very palpable sense of not being aware. And when I say aware of what, I obviously cannot rule out that there may be certain things that I'm aware of which I'm not aware of So, so there, knowing, so when you right? see, when you're sleepwalking, you're not aware, yeah. you're actually relying upon a be, uh, observation of a third person. Exactly. That, that is what you're doing post-waking up, you know? Absolutely. So this which is exactly like saying, like in my dream, I see my grandfather yes. and I tell him, oh, you're not alive. He'll say, no, no, I'm very much alive. Correct. And then when I wake up, so the question is, what, who will you believe? Should I believe the grandfather in my dream or should I believe my experience? So I believe both. Because they are different. No, but then the weights. The we no, but you have to weight them, right? The weightage you have to give. I don't have to. Qualitatively, they both exist. But uh, the certainty, the degree of certainty, is different for both, right? Obviously. Sure. And that's I what set, I'm questioning. I set a standard of certainty, 
which I might favor over the other. Right. So I might right. say that my waking experience right. is more important exactly. than my dream experience. And, and even in a waking experience, right, you can't be sure of, um, um, uh, let's say this, I, I give this tumbler, right, what is it made up of? We, we don't know, we still don't know what matter is made up of. Sure. But, I, but at the same time, I cannot say that I'm not perceiving, you know. The fact that I'm perceiving, I'm having a perception, I'm having an experience, that is irrefutable whether or not I understand the, the nature of matter, you know. That I agree. So, uh, so even there, there's a degree of certainty, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm just trying to see whether there is a case which I can define as being unaware. That's all. I, I guess it's it's not much of a debate here because I think Anintya's point of view is that it is possible to conceive of a state perhaps can be described as being unaware and I think Nitin wants to bring in the point that at any point there has to be certain given reals which you have to take as granted and that one of that or perhaps the uh, given is awareness that you cannot conceive of any experience either without your awareness or someone else reporting using their awareness about your experience. Uh, well, this is one of the questions, I think side question which has emerged from the idea of uh, what is what needs to be certain for any human action to be possible uh, because I think in, in the discussion which we saw, uh, we also saw that how sometimes unreliable the data we have and still we make decisions, we make beliefs and then uh, we also engage in uh, actions which are based on unreliable data. So, but what should be perhaps, uh, or let's put it the other way, uh, can we consider certain at all as something which is reliable or is there anything which is certain anything I mean to put it simplistically would you consider anything which is uh, certain to go back to to go back to points and what I was trying to tell uh, see, even if I have all the gadgets uh, and all the uh, enough labs to to find out, uh, you know what is there in the outer space, and then come back and I, I come back and tell you I don't know. Uh, maybe it may be a qualified I don't know, but still it's a don't know. Yeah, but that doesn't make me feel I know. Yeah, that that's the point I was I was trying to. Uh, to. So what is the analogy there? I mean, with respect to awareness. Uh that point is fine. Yeah, you may be aware that you you are not aware, but that doesn't make you aware. No, but, uh, okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to respond. No, oh, sure. Okay, sure. No, I think I think uh, the, the the point is when you say I'm not aware. I mean, uh, the, is is it a thought? I mean, the question is the content of the thought may be false, right? But that doesn't make your experience false. The fact that you're experiencing cannot be negated. That's my point I'm making. I'm not saying That's the decision of the thought, the content of the thought. Yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, Nitin is trying here to uh, pull a point saying that even uh, no, what Subha said is even when you're aware of it, ignorant, that doesn't make you uh, knowledgeable about something. Uh, which means uh, awareness itself perhaps also can be questioned in terms of its givenness. That at any point, uh, perhaps we, I mean, the larger question is can awareness, is awareness inclusive of ignorance as well apart from knowledge? But I think we will stop the question there because I see many um, uh, question, uh, question mark faces and uh, readiness to speak at. Uh, so we'll perhaps stop it here and then we will again debate. Uh, okay, I, I, I think please hold on because I saw Jeevan Lada, uh, you know, wanting to ask a question from 10th minute of our discussion. So perhaps, uh, uh, so perhaps I should give her the choice. And please wait for the microphone, please. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, please here. Yeah. Ramesh, can you give her the microphone, please? One second, one second. I don't Full sense of awareness, you ride your bike, and how certain you are that someone else from the back will hit you. And even if you look at your body organs, how certain you are that certain latent forms of disease is developed within your body, even if in you know the context of full senses and awareness that you uh, you know take care of yourself. Is that a simple question or is that a simple as this? It's a comment. More a comment, right? Yeah, I said like it. Certain diseases develop within our organs and system, even latent. All right. Okay. Got it. 
and uh, I'm coming to you. I think I saw, uh, yeah, you had a question, right? Uh, Please wait for the microphone. Uh, so, one clarification. It might be convenient if you uh, direct the question to one of us, but if it's open and anybody can respond, you can mention that also. Uh, my question is to Nitin. So, if you are saying that our experiential uh, understanding of awareness, what would be your first memory, if you say memory as an experience, what would be your first memory of being aware and then therefore being certain? No, I mean, in uh, the way I see it. So, uh, like, if you if you're saying a starting point is an axiom of being aware, do you have a starting point where you can say that you were aware? This is the first time I was aware. No, I think uh, so. I would not uh, put memory as. Uh, more fundamental than uh, awareness, the way you are saying that I, I wouldn't want to resort to memory to tell me that I'm aware. I, I can ask you the question right now, are you aware? So the question can be answered going back to our experience. We don't have to refer to memory, you know. So it's in, so memory is a different dimension or memory is a different aspect which may help regarding the content of experience. But the fact that I'm conscious, the fact that I'm having a conscious experience, to me it is, memory is, doesn't play a role, at least the way I see it, you know. And, that, uh, the other question is like if in terms of like what we say are deja vu so it could be happening in a parallel universe whatever see, I, I think see in your question what is implied is that you're assuming a one-dimensional linear time in which things happen uh, to me that's an inference you know uh, i'm not assuming that's what you're assuming because you're saying the first memory you, you're you're seeing this or even deja vu deja vu when you say it's about periodicity right yeah. something has happened and something has happened later so you're assuming one dimensional time actually even in the realm of physics time is very difficult to understand and uh, so i mean that's a big debate you know so to me this uh, memory and deja vu these are not uh, pointing to the fact of experiencing, you know, that, that's a separate okay. point. Perhaps yeah. we'll come back again. Uh, uh, Madam, please, uh, one second. Uh, I think uh, before you, before you, I think you, because you had, yeah. No, 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 no. yeah. Yeah, j just hold on, Jeevan, and I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, my one, uh, so what I have been uh, observing here, like, you know, there is always, uh, can we comprehend reality in its totality? Is it possible, first? So, if we cannot, then we do not have any, any control over what is going to be, because we can only act, and that act should be on the, you know, our ability of, uh, you know, the, our ability to make a decision on, on the basis of our experience, on what uh, Nitin has been saying. So, I am saying that if we cannot, if we accept the fact that we cannot, uh, you know, comprehend reality in its totality, therefore, whether uncertainty or the that this uh, total thing that you know and everything is uncertain, whether that should uh, influence our decision making, then we will be in this perpetual uh, thing of you know indecision. Like I don't know, everything is uncertain. Therefore, I should probably stop uh, from uh, you know taking any or I should not take any decision. So, and again, uh, it metaphysically when Arjuna, uh, uh, you know he hesitates to fight because uh, in the Mahabharata then uh, Krishna says that it's your you don't know because uh, there are other actors so the result is always going to be uncertain you can only be take a decision and act upon it and it should come from your good intention because the result is unknown because there are other other actors so therefore whether uncertainty should uh, my question is open uh, whether uncertainty should influence our decision making i think uh, we will reflect upon that question for a couple of minutes and because i think uh, we will take a few more questions and uh, yes um, I, I, I have uh, is, is, uh, okay maybe we can respond no, so uh, just hold no, on. no 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 so what uh, i think what sangeeta was saying is that we could take a few more questions if you have questions related to what he asked related. because then it makes sense otherwise we'll be drifting into too many topics yes, something related uh, no uh, one small comment before the basic the first one Real, uh, relating the awareness actually uh, here for some reason we equate awareness with the consciousness but we know perfectly well that bacteria are aware any life is aware of the surrounding bacteria trying to escape avoid death so it is aware of its surroundings so in that sense awareness is not exactly and bacteria but can we say that bacteria is certain or not we can't so this my now um, the main question is comment related to Nitin to Dr. Nitin so uh, 
what I understand this uh, approach here is that certainty is a probabilistic concept. It has to be probabilistic. And in most most of uh, applications that we can think of, it is a probability that something, and this probability doesn't depend on the whether is even existence of humans or even life. We know perfectly well that Earth was uh, uninhabited for the first few million years, few hundred million years, for example. But there was a sun. So it, as far as sunrise, will the sunrise happen tomorrow? Actually, there is a probability that it won't happen. For example, suddenly some aliens come and destroy our sun, <laughs> make black hole out of it. Whatever. It can happen even if we don't exist, if there is no life on this planet. But uh, there is one certainty, or at least um, a certainty in, as far as I can think about, within a certain time frame. And this certainty is the expansion of the universe. So, I don't know what will happen tomorrow or next minute with me, maybe the meteorite will strike this uh, room, but I know for certain that tomorrow the universe will continue to expand. All right. So, uh, there's this kind of a frame. Thank you. I think there are two different questions there. So, uh, perhaps uh, uh, what you asked about, can you want to respond to that, can we comprehend reality in totality? That was the first question. And if we cannot, all of the decisions are based on perhaps uh, incomplete knowledge and therefore uncertain. Uh, so, anyone want to just, yeah, I think you want, and then we'll come to your uh, point, madam. Uh, no, I think uh, to Binoy and then, Binoy and then to him. Yeah. After, afterwards, okay, I'll come back to you. So, no, on, to on, on, to on you. this question, can we comprehend reality? And then you added in totality. Uh, do we want to do that? Uh, you know, do we want to comprehend everything in totality? It's, it's, a, it's a tough question, especially from the perspective that I was I was presenting. The state does not have the luxury of waiting to comprehend everything in totality because if it has to wait for totality the reality will keep changing yeah yeah you don't have the luxury forget about the state at times even you don't have the luxury to to so this reality and the totality i'm not sure uh, whether we want it's not can uh, whether we should yeah, maybe yeah. Then briefly because yeah, so going back to so when I said that you have to acknowledge uncertainty, what I mean is you have to acknowledge the complexity behind the uncertainty. That is very very important. You know, you you can't be arrogant in that sense. You know, that should decide should uh, inform all the decisions. The complexity of things. You know, more most often than not, we we don't see that. You know, the models are. It's okay to have a simple model, but we need to be aware of the complexity of whatever we're modeling. And that uh, that's what the point that I'm making about humility, and you know that will and whatever decisions we make henceforth, uh, at least you know um, uh, I mean it's sort of informed from this uh, understanding. That's how I would look at it. Yeah. You want to respond? Yeah. My simple point is this: that any one moment of my existence is not uncertain. What I do not know is what is coming, but I'm prepared to deal with eventualities. But at one particular point of time, my knowledge of reality is far from complete, but whatever little I can sense, I take a decision, which is perhaps the most plausible one, at that point of time, and it may be a right or a wrong decision, that's a different matter, but there is no uncertainty at that point of action. The point of action is very definitive. Where is uncertain is we don't know what the next point of action will be. So that's my way of looking at it as a part. Yeah, well, I, I think I'll close my mouth because I see several hands. Uh, so I, I thought I saw Binoy first and then after that you. He, he had raised his hand first, so after that you. Yeah, two things. First of all, to repeat what he said, uh, how much it is different from Cartesian dualism of uh, I think Binoy. that's why I am. What is that? You said about uh, awareness is a... Uh, up, because awareness is the reality, uh, the certainty. So, how much it is different from Cartesian dualism of high thing, that's why I am. No, no, I, I think there uh, uh, it's just the opposite because there we're relying upon thought. I mean, to me, thought, for example, you can have the experience of deep sleep or you can have the experience of uh, uh, swoon, you know, wherein. So, I, I, my uh, certainty of uh, experience is not dependent upon thought. Whereas, I think the Descartes, so I wouldn't agree to that at all. I think, therefore, I am. That to me, Again, going back to the other statement about memory, you know, to depend upon uh, the certainty of experience on memory or thought, to me, is not the right approach. So the awareness but itself is a thought, correct? No, that, that's what I don't agree. That, that's exactly my point. That that is where I'm saying it is not. This is the eternal debate. Yeah, that is, of course, we agree to disagree here. No, maybe. so maybe just one line here. 
perhaps you know the second point that I raised about the content of your awareness that is perhaps colored by your thoughts and memories right, right? so I am colorblind so I see someone wearing a green shirt whereas Nitin sees that person wearing a red shirt I think we are both aware but our content of our awareness is shaped by various factors yeah, like if you bring experience, experience, experientialism there yes Yes, please, sir. I have a question to the whole panel, basically. So, isn't it, uh, as Dr. Nitin said about it, isn't it driven by karma or dharma? Because whether you are a bacteria or anybody, or a person or Yudhishthira in this case, because his five, four brothers were lying unaware, and he, it was his karma or dharma of Yudhishthira to answer the question of yaksha and to get through. So, I mean to say, even if you are aware or unaware in a mathematical process, in that in that mathematical theorems which are already proved or not proved, but the desire to progress ahead and reach from point X to point Y is more important and the being aware or unaware is a shade of grey between what Ananya sir said and you said about it. Because if, if that is the case, then progress in science cannot happen. So when we see some, some something happening, then we experiment about it, when we don't have the hypothesis, and then, then we uh, value the result in terms of our hypothesis. And when the result is certain accuracy, then we say, okay, this is a universal fact now, or a theorem now. So that uh, what the point I'm trying to convey is, if you want to have a desire of commuting from point X to point Y, then only all these questions arise and you know it can become your karma or dharma. So unaware or aware is a different aspect of it, but if the bacteria don't want to progress, or bacteria want to get away from the system, or humanity or as Suma sir said about you know the nations, nations don't take a standpoint. So that means the desire of a nation to take a standpoint or not, that defines the things. Okay, I think perhaps before you respond, let us see whether the questions are related because they, they were raising. Yeah, you. Yeah, please wait for the microphone. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. So, uh, I, w I have a comment on this uh, particular discussion that the real uncertainty has been omitted from the discussion because it doesn't involve quantum mechanics. Because uh, according to the physics perspective, the real uh, uncertainty arises from the quantum mechanics uh, as we know. All the other things are momentarily uncertain, but you can definitely know about it. Uh, but I know the, that would be more, I mean, that would involve more, so more time and more effort uh, to involve that in the discussion. Uh, but my question goes for the Nitin sir. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, say, uh, 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 what I feel is like you can't uh, take anything as uh, the axiom and start with. For example, if I want to uh, prove the Pythagoras theorem, I can't assume that uh, the Pythagoras theorem is proved and say that the Pythagoras theorem is so. Uh, I am aware that the Pythagoras theorem is proved. So, but, uh, no. No, no, I mean, uh, any mathematical framework has axioms. You just are not aware of it. In that case, it will be the Euclid's axiom or you know, the Peano's axiom. So, it's always a set of axioms you start with uh -huh. and then you prove theorems. You never prove anything in isolation. Yeah, but uh, my or you should start with the axioms. That, that yeah, but my question uh, for that is, can any statement be the axiom? Axiom. Any statement can can that can any statement be an axiom? That's my question. You could you could choose you could actually uh, design a formal axiomatic system having any uh, any statement as an axiom. That's fine, and that will have its own consequences. Consequences. You'll have certain theorems, certain non-theorems. But every uh, mathematical system does start from axioms and rules of inference. Right. You start from there and then you produce theorems. You never prove anything out of the blue. It's, it's not possible, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I but, think, uh, uh, I mean, we can have a dialogue one to one, but uh, let us make it a little more broader so that quantum mechanics discussion can be done separately as well. Right, right, right. right. Yeah? I, I got it. So I think so, one question is still staying without an answer there. So, but we do remember that is desire more fundamental than awareness. But I think uh, you had a couple of questions. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Question to Professor Anindya. I think I could quite relate to when you said about the beauty of uncertainties. I think when you make things certain, we kill optimism also at the same process. Because uncertainty makes us optimists on certain things. And it's about, you know, whether it's about say, human relations, whether it's about, uh, you know, suppose for example, 
you know, whether a particular India-Pakistan friendship is possible or not. Suppose you for certain know that it is not possible, then you are, you know, also leaving out the option of optimism. So I think uncertainty has a role to play, uh, both in the, you know, whether it is relations among societies or in individual relations and individual decisions. And I think we have to live with uncertainty and we enjoy uncertainty probably more than certainty. Okay, I think yeah, please, just uh, I think Vengar had something. No? Okay. Uh, you want to respond to that? Otherwise, uh, but I think again that fundamental question which he asked, any, any one of us is free to respond or any one of the audience, is desire much more fundamental than awareness uh, uh, because our actions are in fact influenced by our desires itself. But uh, would, you, would you say that even awareness would precede even desire? I mean, yeah, when you say desire, uh, you are aware of, you, you know the desire, right? You are aware of the desire. So to me, awareness seems to be really, really fundamental. I mean, sorry about that, but that's the axiom I cannot drop, you know, or I cannot put it in number two position. It's number one, yeah. Well, well in philosophical language, which we talk about intentionality and, uh, you know, intentionality itself shows the directedness of consciousness. I mean, if you further interpret it as a moment of desire, but that itself shows a, a direct, directedness of your consciousness, of, you know, perhaps a larger awareness. Uh, I mean, when you talk about so desire also, you know, how much of it is biological, how much of it is physiological, the, I mean, there are, uh, uh, or psychological, the, the point is, these kind of debates come in, you know. Yeah, but I think uh, this question is very fundamental because uh, usually uh, our modes of existence, such as desire, is undermined to explain these kind of very complex topics like uncertainty because desire basically grounds us somewhere and to start somewhere perhaps with more concrete ways of looking into it. Uh, so it's a larger, much deeper question. I think we have to try to respond to it. We'll see, but maybe we'll come back to it again. But I think, uh, anything you want to respond to that now? Okay. Okay. Um. You know, uh, Chanakya apparently belong to a sect called uh, Ajivikas. Okay. So they are hard determinists. In their world or world view, uh, uncertainty simply doesn't exist. They say that you know something needs to exist and they will make it happen. If it doesn't exist, they'll say it's a temporary phase and I, I, I will make it happen. So I believe uh, you know this kind of hard determinism and uh, complete denial of uncertainty was the very basis of Chanakya's accomplishments. And uh, I want to know what is Subha's thoughts on uh, its relevance to modern statecraft. In fact, one can say the same thing about people like Alexander and uh, even Hitler for that matter. You know, they believed in something and they made it happen, positively or negatively. Uh, and uh, this sect was known as Ajivikas. It's quite surprising that, uh, you know, in, uh, that such a sect or belief system could exist in uh, ancient India, art determinism. Uh, this is separate from our belief in karma and so on, which is a completely uh, separate issue. That's the question for Subha. And uh, for Nitin, you know, I have a, a question. For something to be aware, uh, it has to exist first, actually. So shouldn't existence uh, be the primary axiom, uh, which also follows from uh, a popular uh, catchphrase in philosophy, which is the self-forbiddingness of nothingness. That is, nothingness cannot exist. So something has to exist. And then the question arises about you know, the, uh, the the thing that exists being aware of its own existence and so on and so forth. So these are the two questions I have. Yeah. Very, very interesting. You know, theoretically, in both uh, realism and to an extent even relativism uh, goes closer to what uh, you, were, you were telling. Uh, even if the state is not aware of the intentions of the other, uh, it still feels the theories, both the realist and the relativist theories, even if I don't know your intentions entirely, it can still be dealt with and it adds an adjective decisively. Uh, so, you know, it's, there is nothing is uncertain. Even if it is uncertain, I, I have the ability to, uh, to, to deal with uh, decisively. It's, it's not, an, uh, not, an, not an issue. Uh, yeah, so I will admit that I am a Vedantin. So to me, existence and awareness are the same when it comes to the fact of experience of being aware, uh, at least that particular axiom. Uh, but for something else, uh, for an object to be, uh, you are aware of an object and does it exist? I think, they, I don't know whether they are the same or not, but I think when, we, when I say that I am aware, uh, to me, the, uh, it's like saying that uh, uh, 
you know, the, the, whatever, the sun is hot and it is shining. I mean, you can't separate the two, right? I mean, what I'm saying is that the, the fact of awareness or the fact of experience that I'm aware and the fact that I exist, it can't be separated for that particular experience, is what I would. Uh, Existence and awareness both kind of I mean, for this axiom at least, you know, but for something else that you want to determine the existence of an object, um, I mean, that's a different uh, issue altogether, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, Mohit. Uh, my co question is for Professor Ananya. Uh, can we say with certainty that human minds have handled uncertainty better than animal minds have? We don't know. <laughs> Maybe. But uh, no, I don't think so. I think what would be an assay? What would be an assay for it? How would you test for it? Right? And to me, a very simple minded biological test is existence itself and how long a species has existed. And by all these counts, we are perhaps the most unsuccessful of all species. Yes, we've gone to the moon, we've built a computer, which an amoeba hasn't. But we are really the most vulnerable of all species and perhaps the one most ill-equipped to deal with uncertainty of life within an environment that we live in, right? And, and I will say this, so, so to that extent, the species such as viruses or other parasites are perhaps much more equipped to deal even with uncertainty. It cannot be that only humans live in an uncertain world, right? I think all species live in an uncertain world. And the fact that they've lived for millions of years longer than we have is sure proof that they've handled that uncertainty better. We can create our own environment already. And the species That's not true. That is not true at all. That is not true. Sure, but there are animals also who are able to create their. Not in the uninhabitable environment. We know so advanced that we can go to an uninhabitable environment and create our own. Well, there are organisms that can live with oxygen without oxygen. We can't do it. So, so there. So it depends on what are the factors that are important. So to that extent, different species have adapted differently to the environment and what elements of the environment matter to them, right? And in, to that extent, I think humans are extremely specialized. We have lost our generalization, generalized ability to survive. If you take me today and put me in Alaska without a jacket or whatever, I will die. No, no, but uh, bacteria which can live without oxygen, give, give oxygen and will kill it. It might, it might not. No, I agree, I agree. But in general, over evolutionary time, over evolutionary time, you find that some species, so the cockroach, let's look at the cockroach. It has lived unchanged for 300 million years. It has survived. It can live on wax. It can live on human hair. It can internalize heavy metals and it will survive a nuclear. No, the, I don't care. What matters for me is that why do we build an environment? Because we need to survive. The urge is to survive. The fact is, it does. If it doesn't need to build an environment, but is itself adapted to different environments, then that's that strategy. Our strategy is to build an environment. The cockroach's strategy is to just adapt by its sheer biological properties. So to that extent, I think. We haven't dealt with life very easily. Well, <laughs> no, uh, that Mohit's uh, question, Anindya, uh, on uh, human mind and uh, animal mind, it presupposes that we we understand or yeah, we know the I animal mind. I don't know. So yeah. I don't know. So there are philosophers who believe, as uh, she pointed out, she called it awareness. But there are philosophers like John Stone Sheets, who calls amoeba conscious, because according to her. The definition of consciousness and ability to sense the environment and react appropriately to it. If an organism is able to do that much, by her definition, it's conscious. So I don't want to get into a debate of what is awareness, what is consciousness, where do they part ways or don't they at all part ways. But in general, we know very little about the animal mind in that sense, the non-human mind. Let's go at that. And to that extent, therefore, I'm using as a Martian would say, oh, this animal has lived 
million years more than that animal. So therefore, I th and this animal is dying out faster than that animal is. To my mind, that animal has equi is better equipped to handle uncertainty. Simple, so but maybe you know, not. I think we now want to process. Yeah. Actually, you may know, he is a famous uh, evolutionary biologist who argued that uh, uh, the adaptation and cognitive evolution should be uh, dealt separately. So if we consider cognitive evolution, we can say that it is the ability of the denial. He, he, terms his book, he titled his book itself is Denial. It is very high in humans compared to other animals. Sure. So they deny it because they, and they evolved and they become cognitively adapted or advanced because of uh, this ability to deny. True. I mean, I think that's a perspective. That's a perspective. There are two questions here. One, what is cognitive and what is not cognitive, right? So, so that itself is a question that one has to deal with, right? And the second question is, yes, perhaps, we, uh, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins also argues that we are perhaps the only species which can change the course of evolution with our rational thought and actions. Absolutely. That's one measure. But I was, in responding to Mohit, my measure was slightly different. I was looking at it in terms of the sheer grit of life. Does our, will our cognitive abilities enable us to survive the next 1,000 years or not? If we don't survive over the next 1,000 years, what uses of this cognitive evolution? All right, I think I, I see Professor Patnaik's hand. Is there anybody else who, 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 whom I missed? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I think there are two. Yeah, I'm extremely sorry. Yeah, I think uh, the lady over there. And then after that, you, um, Alvi. Yeah, please. Um, so this uh, relates to your uh, pink elephants um, and whether we can yes, conceive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and whether we, we can conceive of a state of un unawareness. So, um, if you think of, uh, you know, when how we were uh, in our younger days, uh, you know, those moments of, let's say, ego, uh, when we acted in ego but really weren't aware of doing it, and, but now looking back you can see that you did. So, I mean, that suggests to me that the level of our awareness is really a measure of your evolution. Um, so, animal, human, yogi, uh, you know, different levels of awareness. And I, I would put animal below human because they, as far as we can tell, don't have the ability to reflect on their choices and change their behaviors. They're kind of running on autopilot for, you know, most things. Uh, you know, dogs will chase cats forever and, you know, they'll never ask why. Um, Can I just briefly respond? Yeah. First is, I think we now know, through more detailed studies, that uh, animals, non-human species, are capable of quite a bit more of voluntary control of actions uh, than we've given them credit for. That's one short sure. answer. Yeah. Uh, the second is, and this is a very important point, yeah. whether if I spent one week with you without speaking to you even once, mm -hmm. I would be very hard pressed to establish whether you reflect at all. So a lot of our knowledge about reflection, about being aware of what you're aware of, comes because you can report it to me. Unfortunately, since we cannot communicate with animals, it's a methodological problem. We do not know whether they are capable of reflection or not. Okay, reflection leading to change, not just reflection. No, but animals do change. No. They do change strategies. But sure, what but is that a product of we do not understand is what I'm saying. But um, ha can you, I mean, I'm not an animal expert sure. or anything, but uh, for the most part, would you say that animals have any change in an animal's behavior has only uh, related to its survival, not for, for instance, improving itself or reaching higher levels of consciousness. Oh, by the way, why do we improve ourselves for survival as well, for a better uh, quality of survival? Uh, that's, uh, but uh, that's, that could be one reason. But uh, that, I would say that that's also one stage of your evolution when you're changing just 
for a better quality of life, but then you reach a point where you're changing to for, for, a, for a higher purpose. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, very, very deep questions there of higher purpose, self-transformation. But I think uh, uh, one thing, perhaps fact, which we have to agree is though there is a huge potential for self-transformation in the human world, that the absence of it cannot be proved in the animal world because just because we don't know about it. And also there are several instances where you know, you find experiences about animals itself, themselves, which show something which is much more than perhaps we usually assume them to possess. Yeah. But, but uh, madam, can we, <laughs> because uh, please write to us your question, we'll, uh, you know, we'll pass it on and then again we can continue to the debate just for the paucity of time. I think Aditi wanted to ask a question and Professor Patnaik has been waiting very patiently and I saw some hands here too. I really don't know. Okay, I'll come back to Aditi, please. Yeah, my question is to Dr. Anandya. So, uh, like you said, uh, my question actually is that are uh, animals, like maybe say amoeba, like very lower level animals, even capable of perceiving uncertainty? I mean, do they even have centers, say, I mean, not in the brain or maybe somewhere, but that uh, they can perceive the past and the future? Because, uh, yeah, if they don't, then they only react based on their, yeah, their present, right? So, yeah, so that's my question. Basically. Okay, again, two responses. The first response is that, again, as I suggested to him, our responses are at that moment, right? It doesn't take into account uncertainty. Because when we are at that moment, the period of uncertainty is over. The period of uncertainty comes before we reach that moment because we are then trying to imagine whether that moment will come or will not come. What you can say is a very powerful uh, property that humans have is an ability to conceive that if in an uncertain world, what are the states that can be reached? What would be my responses to each of those states? So I'm prepared and then when the moment comes, I react appropriately, right? So that's an advantage we definitely have. But, and that I cannot deny. However, if you look at the quality of the life of the amoeba, it's very different from the quality of the life that I have, apparently. The amoeba or the cockroach has very simple demands of life, right? And therefore, it reaches a point when it has only a few limited choice of action and depending on what the situation is, it will either do or do not, it will not be able to do and if it does, it will either live or it will not live. If you look at it in terms of human, uh, from a human perspective, of course living and not living is not as immediate a problem as it is perhaps for the amoeba or the cockroach. It's a little more far removed from us. But I think the nature of the problem is very similar. We live in a richer world, at least as far as we can say, and therefore our levels of uncertainty, our ability to respond to uncertain situations is far more complex than that of an amoeba. But if you look at it in, as a measure of survival, then I think the amoeba does better. I, I would again insist on that simply because of a very simple fact of existence that it has successfully negotiated survival over changing environments and we haven't tested ourselves enough but whatever little we are seeing I think we won't do very well. Professor <laughs> Badnai, please wait for the microphone. microphone. Wonderful discussion about this topic. What I imagined is uh, what is certain about uncertainty if there are a lot of uncertainties still. I have a couple of quick uh, comments, one to Professor Nitin. You mentioned about awareness in the world, that being a fundamental axiom. So when we talk about axiom in maths, generally my understanding is, we take a fairly simple, well accepted thing as the axiom. Okay? Not all encompassing thing where there are issues like uh, whether what I am aware, what are the facts I am aware, are they correct, to what precision, are they reliable? There are many issues underlying that, okay? But when you say I am aware, it encompasses a lot of issues there, okay? What knowledge? So that is one point, because you start from that is the starting point. Of course, there were debates about not being aware. 
for a mathematician that is not a big problem one can treat it as a complement of uh, being a wag or if i look at the set theory when diagram the complement of that will be not aware that is not a big issue but you start off with being aware as a fundamental axiom that's whether that is acceptable that is what was my issue should we not have much simpler well accepted things because even in engineering systems you know whether you talk about measurements maths models everything there are a lot of uncertainties okay nothing is correct the second point i had to professor an in india is again a new question for me uh, you made a statement that uh, animals and human particularly human beings there are a lot of uh, conflicting decisions requirements constraints on this spur of the moment we take a decision you get into maths model equations yes we talk about many constraint optimization techniques heuristics all that stuff of course in biological systems extending that people talk about learning models and all that so is there any simple theory or concept how it happens when there is a complex multidimensional system like this which one is weighed more how that happens in the spur of the moment of course if it is a wrong decision fine you can say the learning takes over and all that okay is there anything a simple concept explain biological systems or any maths uh, maybe i'm ignorant but i don't know of that perhaps we know i may be able to respond to that but what we've done in the course of our studies is we've tried to understand a certain kind of complex behavioral interaction in my macaques in the monkeys that i study and what we found was that when a ma- individual macaque takes a fairly complex decision it's a social decision with when it's interacting with two other individuals it takes a decision and the reason why we wanted to look at it is we were seeing variability across individuals in taking this decision we were able to see that there are three factors and i'm not going to the details which it seems and this we did using regression models we found there were three factors that seemed to influence the probability of the monkey taking a decision a versus b right so to the extent we knew that all these three factors play a role maybe one was more important than the other but at the more final level than that i really do not know how it is so we are i think destined to figure out what are the factors that influence the decision making process but which of these factors an individual will play uh, will take a decision on more importantly is something perhaps may differ from a case by case basis but a lot of it is limited by our perception of what the other species is perceiving so there is a problem there i think, I think uh, it's perhaps a good idea to conclude this uh, dialogue but i i i, I guess hipu and the young man they had oh. okay Okay, it is small, right? Okay. All right, okay. Oh, thank you. Uh I was just wondering listening to everything uh can uncertainty exist without time? Without time. Okay, we'll take some time to think about it. Uh, uh the yeah, you and you, you wanted to make it brief, huh? Okay. No quantum mechanics now. <laughs> yeah, so what I want to say is uh, that awareness may not what i uh, what i want to say is the awareness is not the axiom per se but it is the final proof that we uh, that for to which we are heading with all this discussion to define that that's what i feel uh, and the starting and end point that's what i'm trying to say uh, i think the scope of the discussion uh, can be broadened to how do we respond to uncertainty and uh, then you know in economics we know people who are risk takers and risk averse so some people take because those take people who you know are risk takers they actually love uncertainty i mean they don't know what is the consequence would be but still they go for it this are is those who are risk averse so uh, i think that also you know when the discussion of uncertainty is incomplete without uh, taking uh, sort of the responses what we have to uncertainty yeah. can i just say one line in response to this what we understand from non human species is there is no risk averse or risk prone individual it's conditional 
and I suspect that it's true for humans as well. We may switch between risk being risk prone versus risk averse depending on what the costs are, what the benefits are and most of the studies in psychophysical experiments that have been done have tested within a narrow limited range of constraints and rewards. I think the moment you expand that scope and we see this from our daily life, there are certain things we can be risk prone about and certain things we can be risk averse. So I again, the reason I made this point is I think we should avoid simplifications which perhaps are not warranted unless we really explode in a way. Well, uh, I, I hope there won't be any more hands up because it's really time. Uh, well, I guess uh, this was a very fascinating evening where we have very open-ended questions from the beginning to the end, uh, but definitely there are complex ideas and complex notions which we had to carry home. And at least some of these, at least which uh, um, uh, I would say stuck to my mind, uh, one is the whole uh, possibility of desire because that is something which we tend to undermine. Uh, so, you know, what, what exactly is the role of desire in understanding uncertainty or in responding to uncertainty? The other is the unknowability and the de degree of ignorance which uh, faces us day in and day out and uh, how do we incorporate the degrees of ignorance in handling uncertainty? And the third is fundamentally we are talking about experience and uh, even the notion of uncertainty uh, is meaningful only as far as our experience takes us to. And uh, uh, in this discussion perhaps it's also interesting to ask is there something called totality of reality because is there at all something called totality of reality? Is reality total at any point of time or are there multiple realities? Uh, or is the uh, notion of totality and reality itself very human centric which are again kind of based on perhaps certain finite number of components. Uh, I think uh, it's also extremely important to look at how after all this discussion how do we bring in these very complex ideas into our human existence and perhaps even if you don't use the word such as survival but to increase the quality of life how uncertainty can perhaps as you said perhaps increase the quality in life and uh, make life much more enriching than perhaps making us more doubtful and inactive perhaps uh, you know perhaps this is the way towards more action oriented life and perhaps also seeing things with much more empathy and I think as Nitin said perhaps humility uh, so this was a very fascinating discussion and I don't think I myself have ever experienced such a very enriching uh, discussion. Uh, certainly all uh, thanks go to my colleagues, uh, uh, the patients they took to work on this. It's extremely difficult to talk about this topic even if it's 10 minutes, you know. So I'm very grateful to all my colleagues to have taken so much serious seriousness in preparing for it and uh, talking to you this evening. And may I request, to e request you to email us your comments and questions because we need not stop this dialogue here. And if you email, you would know that email ID, right? Nias Consciousness at uh, Nias Consciousness Program at gmail.com. I can uh, put it on to other people and they can respond to you. And then another question which I want to leave you with today is what are the topics you think are very important to be debated at the evening philosophy chats? Please do write to us. Because what are those fundamental concepts which will never take us to a conclusion? Because I think that is what we have to aim at. Because if there we reach a conclusion, there is nothing much to hope for and look forward to us life. So what are those ideas which we can discuss endlessly and still feel that we have reached somewhere? So thank you so much for your patience and for being here. And uh, look forward to seeing you again here. Thank you.